Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Manager with TRICOM. As an administrative and financial services provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, TRICOM was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are B.J. Hoffman, Michael Klein, and Brett Devin. B.J. is a tax partner with over 23 years of experience in the areas of audit, tax, litigation support. He serves clients in a wide range of industries, including closely held entities in staffing, healthcare, and franchise, as well as law firms. Michael, a tax partner, has more than 30 years of experience providing a wide array of tax and consulting services. Leading the Philadelphia Office's Tax Service Group, he serves as an advisor to clients in a range of industries, including healthcare, manufacturing, distribution, staffing, real estate, and technology. He also heads the firm's Tax Quality Control Committee. Brett is a partner in the firm's Philadelphia office and provides audit, tax compliance, and consulting services to clients in a wide range of industries with a concentration of financial services, retail, staffing, medical, and legal firms, as well as real estate. He has deep expertise in representing clients in front of the IRS, as well as state and local government agencies. Citrin Cooperman is among the largest nationally recognized full-service accounting, audit, tax, and business advisory firms in the United States, currently ranked in the top 25. With locations across the Northeast, Citrin Cooperman has steadily built its business, serving a diverse and loyal clientele since 1979. Their daily mission is to help clients focus on what counts. They enhance the business and personal lives of their clients through a customized approach, which includes offering a wide range of assistance, um, assurance, tax, and business advisory services, including um, forensic services across the globe. Citroen Cooperman has deep experience in a variety of industries, including entertainment, financial services, franchising, healthcare, private equity, real estate, staffing, and technology. Citroen Cooperman is an independent firm associated with Moore Stevens International Limited. Appropriate year-end planning coupled with tailor-made tax strategies should be designed with your specific business in mind to capitalize on tax code laws, reduce tax liability, liability and maximize business profitability. In today's Industry Insider webinar session, we will cover year-end tax planning strategies in light of recent legislation, prospective business and tax plans for the incoming administration, a briefing on the new Department of Labor overtime regulations. Rest assured, by the end of this session, you'll be prepared for year-end planning. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature, which is located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please join me in welcoming BJ. Thanks a lot, Amanda, uh, and good afternoon to everyone uh, that's joining, and, and many thanks for that introduction and to uh, Tricom Funding in general. You guys are a pleasure to deal with. Uh, we've uh, worked together uh, with many staffing clients over the years, and uh, uh, really just a great firm. Um, so as, uh, as Amanda mentioned, uh, just a quick little uh, additional uh, insight on Citrin Cooperman. We are a uh, full-service accounting firm, which generally means that we uh, provide audit, tax and business consulting services. We do have a particular focus on the staffing industry. And in fact, we believe that we provide more accounting services, uh, tax services, and consulting services to the staffing industry than any other accounting firm in the country. Uh, currently, we provide service to more than 150 staffing firms of all shapes and sizes. 
everything from startups to uh, eight, nine hundred million in revenues. So really across all boards and uh, across uh, the geography of the country as well. Um, we do, uh, in addition to the tax work we do, uh, we provide audit services. M&A, merger and acquisition consulting, uh, profitability benchmarking, consulting. Uh, we uh, perform industry surveys and distribute them, and uh, we serve on uh, staffing association boards and are very active in all the conferences, the national conferences. So we have a deep uh, understanding of the staffing industry, and we're very committed to the industry. Today, uh, though, the focus of our discussion will be on income taxes, uh, specifically income tax planning. Uh, and I'm joined, of course, uh, by my uh, partners in Philadelphia here, Michael Klein and Brett Dubin, both tax partners. Michael's the head of our tax group here in Philadelphia, and each of them spends a great deal of time in the staffing space with me. Um, so with that, uh, just a broad outline, we're going to talk uh, about uh, the election. Uh, and uh, potential tax plans that uh, can be taken and brought to bear uh, with the new administration in mind. We'll talk about some of the actually enacted 2016 tax changes, uh, so we'll speak to some year-end planning ideas, and we're going to also touch on a slightly unrelated topic of the overtime regulations that are coming into play very, very soon that will be key to many of you. So with that, let's start with uh, the election. Um, and. I mean this section to certainly be an open session with my colleagues, more of a round table. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of uncertainty here with the uh, uh, tax uh, plan that's been put forth by the Trump um, administration. Uh, the, the Trump plans, which you'll see outlined here, are really just a, a starting point. Uh, we contemplate that there will be a lot of give and take uh, between uh, the Trump Trump administration and Congress. Uh, in general terms, some of the uh, some of the outlined proposals are unlikely to take effect, but are starting points for negotiations. Uh, but I think that, from an overall perspective, one might assume that, in a broad sense, tax rates will be declining uh, in future years. So that should be perhaps our guide for uh, enacting tax planning uh, techniques. So with that, just some, uh, some points uh, that we can talk about on the Trump proposal. Uh, the first thing Trump is proposing is uh, a reduction in the number of tax brackets. Currently, there's seven tax brackets out there, uh, ranging from 10% to a low of 10% to a high of 39.6%. Trump is proposing that we move to three brackets, 12%, 25%, and 33%. Um, so our top rate, if Trump had his way, would drop from 39.6% to 33%. And that 33% bracket would kick in uh, for marrieds uh, at about 225,000 of taxable income. So as you can uh, you can see, the uh, rates will drop, which should mean overall tax burdens drop. But there's some offsetting uh, provisions also that uh, might serve to increase um, uh, taxpayers' tax liabilities. Hey, BJ, um, it's, uh, it's Michael Klein. Just wanted to jump in there. An in interesting uh, fact, if you look at the brackets again, you'll notice that for some Americans, the lower – the, the lower uh, earning uh, taxpayers in America are actually going to have a tax increase if you just look at the brackets. Under the, under the current plan, the, highest rate's the lowest rate is 10%. Under the new plan, if it were to go through, the lowest rate would be 12%. So there's a potential for a tax, rate, a tax increase for lower earning individuals or Americans, uh, which is sort of contrary to uh, what this plan was trying, is, is proposed to be tr attempting to do. Yeah, that's interesting. It certainly hasn't been highlighted to, to date, right. um, but that is an interesting nuance here uh, with these brackets. Um, capital gains, um, uh, currently they're taxed at uh, either 15 or, or 20 percent, depending on where your income level is. Um, Trump's uh, proposing that that stay, that rate for capital gains stay constant, um, but um, the 20% capital gains rate would kick in uh, for income in excess of $225,000 for those that are married, which is a lower threshold, Michael, uh, than we're currently seeing, correct? Yeah, right, right now it's a little is, over 400000 
to have yeah. the 20% kick in. So the, higher, so the higher rate kicks in at a lower level, which is essentially it would be a tax increase, right? Yes. Um, another interesting point. Many of us are, are used to having their itemized deductions, writing off charity and uh, um, taxes and, and mortgage interest. Uh, and essentially, there's an unlimited amount that one might deduct under the current uh, tax structure. Trump has put out there that itemized deductions would be maxed out at $200,000 for married or 100 for single. So in other words, if you had more than $200,000, if you're married and have more than $200,000 of itemized deductions, uh, you'd be limited to claiming only 200000 of itemized deductions. Now, that doesn't affect most of us. Uh, but certainly for the ultra-high-income taxpayers that may have huge amounts of charitable contributions, that would serve to limit the uh, the value of those major, major charitable contributions, I suppose. Um, there, there is some, uh, you know, prior to the Trump proposal, there was bipartisan support to limit itemized deductions. It was, it was going, it was previously. Uh, Congress was looking at both the Republicans and the Democrats uh, had agreed in principle to limit itemized deductions based on the tax rate uh, or the tax benefits, so they were going to limit the deductions to 28 percent. Um, here, uh, this is much more restrictive because it actually limits it to a dollar amount. Right. Um, so there's a huge difference here, but 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 still in line with. Uh, the Congress's attempt to limit itemized deductions in some form. On the point of overall tax simplification, uh, especially for those with lower incomes, uh, the next point is uh, an increase in the standard deduction from uh, 12600 to 30000 for married taxpayers would ultimately serve to, uh, you know, simplify uh, the tax preparation for uh, lower-income taxpayers. They wouldn't have to worry about itemizing. And, and in fact, if their taxable income was uh, really, before the standard deduction was lower than $30,000, they wouldn't have any tax liability at all. So um, that point speaks to overall tax simplification. Um, there are some other points of simplification. Uh, the elimination of personal exemptions, which are uh, slightly over 4,000 currently um, for per individual. Um, and other tax simplification proposals uh, address the dreaded AMT, or the alternative minimum tax, which is, for those of you that don't know, uh, essentially a shadow tax system that lies behind the traditional tax computation, uh, it certainly serves to, um, to make tax preparation more complicated and tends to hit those uh, upper middle class uh, taxpayers who have income in the range of 250 to 450,000 of income each year. Um, it, it serves currently to limit the value of their, uh, some of their itemized deductions. So Trump is proposing that the AMT be eliminated. Um, but it is a big revenue generator for the government. So the question remains is if you eliminate um, the AMT and, and, and drop some of these tax rates, uh, currently nonpartisan tax foundations estimate that that would increase the federal debt by $5 trillion um, over, I, I believe, a 10-year period. So it, it really underscores the notion that, you know, uh, everyone loves tax uh, reductions, but you still have to pay for tax reductions, and how are you going to get this through Congress? Um, so there's there's major questions about uh, about this this plan. Um, further, the estate tax, which really only affects 02 percent of the U.S. population, uh, essentially affecting those with estates more than five and a half million dollars, really for ten million dollars for those that are married. Um, the estate tax would be eliminated, uh, which would make the super wealthy happy. Uh, of course, there still may be in state inheritance taxes that are in play, even if the federal estate tax is eliminated. But uh, certainly that's been a, uh, a target for the Republicans for a long, long time to get rid of the estate tax. Now, the next point, which is more on point possibly to many of you staffing companies, uh, is the corporate tax rates. And there's been some 
A, uncertainty, and B, a, a sort of a moving target element here on this point. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a real lack of clarity. First of all, for those of you that are C corporations, which is probably not many of you, the maximum corporate rate is proposed to be 15% uh, for C corporations at this point in time. Um, for those of you that are S corporations or pass-throughs pass like LLCs, um, initially, there was some talk of a maximum tax rate on that business income of 15%. Uh, and, and when we all initially saw that, we were looking at each other thinking, wow, that's a major, major tax cut for most business owners. In reality, um, this has been a pretty vague point, and there's now this notion out there from the Trump side that the 15% tax rate may just apply for earnings that are retained at the business level and that there might be an additional tax imposed on distributions from your business entity to the individual. Um, so that would be more akin to the double taxation that's in existence for C-corporations. I don't know, Michael, if you want to add any insight to, to that, but, um, but certainly it is a moving target. And what we originally thought might be a huge, huge tax break for businesses might in fact not be a, much of a tax break at all. Yeah, I think I think what's what 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 uh, Trump is attempting to do with this proposal is with is really to help small businesses that are using profits to funnel them back into their own business, and by only ta on taxing undistributed earnings at fifteen percent, it allows a small business to pay less and. Uh, um, conserve cash and, and be able to uh, continue to fund the growth of their company. Um, with, with a mature business that's distributing almost all of its profits, um, I, this, this won't have much of an effect because of the secondary tax that's being proposed on the actual distribution of, uh, of, the, of the profits. So, I mean, I view this as, you know, I was thrilled when I saw it because Citroen Cooperman's a partnership and it would have been a huge tax break for for the three of us. For us. Uh, right. However, uh, I don't, uh, as I started to read into the proposal, I, I became a little more uh, less enthused about it uh, than before. But it, it, it will be a slightly uh, more complicated for uh, people in our profession to be able to track the, these amounts, how much is distributed and how much is undistributed. But clearly, uh, I view this as something helping the small business as opposed to the fully mature uh, flow-throughs that, that a lot of our clients are already. So yeah, I think, I think it's going to benefit more corporations, big C corporations, be more competitive with the rest of the world, where our top corporate rates are a lot higher than most other developed countries. So I think the idea is to kind of lower our corporate rates to be more competitive with countries around the world. Exactly. So, you know, if I am a staffing company owner that is uh, either an S Corp or an LLC, this is where I want to focus my attention in the coming months, uh, especially when the new Congress comes in, in in January, to see what kind of movement there is between Trump's proposed plans and what may come through or be uh, approved in Congress. Again, as it stands, what we've just outlined to you uh, would serve to increase the U.S. deficit by uh, $5 trillion, or the debt by $5 trillion. So it's hard to believe that Congress will uh, really sign off and give a green light to, uh, to this plan, uh, you know, these proposals as written here. Um, so I think that this just bears watching and truly is a uh, moving target moving forward. Um, so I hate, hate to be overly speculative uh, because uh, we don't know what's going to happen in 2017. But, I, again, it is fair to say that tax rates should be coming down and tax burdens should be coming down somewhat for most taxpayers, especially, I would think, business owners. Um, but, again, a lot of uncertainty here. Um, so with that, uh, we can sort of finish – speaking to uh, what may be, and there are certain things that we do actually know for 2016. Uh, so, Brett, if you want to, uh, if you want to take that and, uh, and run with the 2016 tax update, that would be great. Yeah, so there have been some permanent tax law changes for, for 2016. Um, these, these laws were passed by Congress at the end of 2015 with the PATH Act, and that's the Protecting Americans from Tax Sykes. 
So what we're going to do is focus on the provisions that are most applicable to staffing companies. And the big one here is the Section 179 expensing. Um, Section 179 allows for the immediate deduction for purchases of property equipment. So in staffing companies, you might buy a lot of furniture, computers, and equipment. So before this, this permanent extension, you're only allowed to deduct your first $25,000 of new fixed asset purchases. With the new PATH Act, you're able to deduct $500,000 as long as you spend under $2 million of new purchase and new capital invested during the year, which most small businesses do. So the strategy here is that if you, if you know you're going to need to buy new computers early in 2017, new furniture, it might pay to make these purchases in 2016, place them in service, and you'll get the full deduction for it now, especially if you think that it looks like tax rates are going to go up in the coming years while rates seem to be as high as they'll ever be or at any time in the near future. It might be worth it to, to buy furniture and equipment that you know you're going to need in the upcoming year and purchase it now and get that deduction up front in 2016. And there's also some other um, business incentives that were made permanent by the PATH Act. Their first one is shorter recovery period for leasehold improvements. Um, leasehold improvements were typically depreciated over 39 years. With the PATH Act, it made it permanent extension that now you can depreciate these leasehold improvements over a 15-year period of time. So you can take a depreciation expense like twice as fast as you were able to take before. The second point is the recognition period for S corporations built on gains tax. Um, this was a previously a 10-year period, and now it's been reduced to five years. And this is the period for which an S corporation must hold its assets following a conversion from a C corporation to avoid this tax. So this really is only applicable if you started out your business as a C corporation and then later converted your C corporation to an S corporation. So you typically before had to hold on to those assets for at least 10 years or you'd have to pay this additional building gains tax, which could be as high as 35%. So this isn't applicable for a lot of companies, but if you were a C corporation, that later on became an S corporation. This is something to look into and keep in mind. Next point is the shareholders' basis reduction for charitable donations for an S corp. There used to be a disadvantage in prior years that if you were a shareholder in an S corporation and you donated appreciated property, you wouldn't be able to get the full charitable de donation deduction on your personal return due to like at risk limitations. So this new rule passed in the PATH Act kind of eliminated that. So now shareholders can get a, a full, de, full deduction for this type of charity. And the last one is the R&D credit. Um, there's many eligible small businesses. You can use this credit now to offset regular tax as well as payroll tax. And in the staffing world, um, if, you have, if you develop own, your own internal software, this would qualify for the R&D credit for federal purposes. So if, this is where we see it mostly in our clients that in the staffing industry, any staffing companies that develop their own software were eligible for this R&D credit. It was going to expire, and with the PATH Act, it extended it permanently, so you're still able to use the R&D credit. So those were some of the key um, provisions that were extended permanently. There are some provisions that they extended for five years and not permanently. Um, the big one for, that we see for our clients and staffing companies is the bonus depreciation. Um, bonus depreciation is the additional first-year depreciation of purchases of new property and equipment, such as computers and furniture. So if you purchase furniture, equipment, in year 2016, you would get an immediate 50% deduction on that purchase of that equipment. So the 50% rate was it was going to go to zero, and this was going to be eliminated. Path Act extended it for five years, but the percentage has, goes down. In 2016 and 17, it's at 50%. In 2018, you only get a 40% deduction. And in 2019, it goes down to 30%. And the last one on the slide is the, the WATSI, the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. And this has been extended for five years. And this is a big deduction, a big credit for the light industrial staffing companies. Um, this credit was available to employers who hire and retain veterans and individuals 
from other target groups with significant barriers to employment. But what the PATH Act did was extend this to unemployed workers. So if you hire any unemployed worker, they have to have been unemployed for more than 27 weeks to qualify. But if they, do, if they have been unemployed for more than 27 weeks, you're eligible for this WASC tax credit. And this can be as much as $9,600 per employee. It's calculated up to 40% of the first 24,000 of wages. So you can see if you pay someone 24,000 who's been unemployed, you'll get a credit for 9,600 against that. So it's a huge credit that, that many light industrial staffing companies take advantage of, and that's been extended for another five years. And this unemployment portion of it has just been added for the year 2016 yes. and going so forward. Just, just to jump in again, to, to those of you um, uh, that make regular practice of, of hiring uh, in the light industrial space and other spaces as well, um, be sure that you are taking advantage of the work opportunity tax credit. If you're not, uh, you should certainly speak to your accountant about it. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it can be a gold mine uh, and is really important to take advantage of if, uh, if you have a workforce that's eligible. Yep. And the next thing, the last slide we have here is just the key business deduction for small business and staffing companies, the automobile expense. So we just want to highlight for, for 2016, the standard business mile rate is 54 cents. It's down a little bit from the year before, which was 57 and a half cents. So this is what deduction you can take on your actual business miles driven during a year. Or you can use, um, if you bought the, the automobile, you can now take depreciation. And with the PATH Act, you're allowed to take up to $8,000 bonus depreciation for a new automobile in the first year. Plus, with the three thousand one hundred sixty dollars, you can take a almost eleven over or eleven thousand dollar depreciation on your automobile in the first year, and that goes to fifty one hundred in the second year, and then in the third year three thousand fifty, and going forward eighteen seventy five for each year. So you see this a lot in smaller businesses and, and also a lot of staffing companies. The vehicle deduction. So, so the, these are all um, uh, items that have been enacted in law for 2016, um, and from here we can talk about some planning techniques and tactics, and, and Michael, uh, you can take it from here. Thanks, VJ. Uh, this will be the interesting part of this presentation. <laughs> um, so many, many of our staffing clients, no matter what size they are, uh, are allowed to be on the cash method of accounting and just briefly, cash method of accounting allow, uh, allows you to pick up income when the cash is actually received from your customers, as opposed to the other method of accounting, which would be accrual method, where you are forced to uh, report income when you actually send out the invoice. So, as many of you know, the difference between when you send out the invoice and when you receive the cash can be either a small amount of time, or if you're like any of my clients, it could be a long amount of time. So. So there is some deferral there that you can take advantage of uh, if you are allowed to be on the cash method. And many of our, uh, our, cl our clients and our staffing clients, uh, fairly large ones, are on the cash method of accounting. So I'm going to speak to those of you that are on the cash method of accounting because there's a tremendous amount of flexibility there. Uh, when, when, on the accrual basis, not that much, and I'll address some of the planning techniques for them uh, as well. So um, clearly, in any time we do tax planning for anybody and on any method of accounting, uh, in a normal year, we are always, uh, the, the, the golden rule is to defer income and accelerate deductions. The only time that that would not uh, be the golden rule is if we are anticipating a tax increase uh, for the next year. And in that case, we would want to accelerate income and pay the lower tax in the current year as opposed to deferring it into the future year where the taxes are going to be higher. So based on the beginning of our presentation where we see uh, that there are, there are already out tax proposals out for next year to lower income, the income tax rate, we are going to employ uh, the standard uh, planning, which is defer income and accelerate deductions. So for those of you on the cash method of accounting, we, we always look to try to methods of deferring income. And so uh, some things we like to talk to our clients is uh, towards the end of the year, 
is to is if if you're able to and if the, your cash flow allows you to is to slow down your billing and maybe instead of billing at the beginning of the month and having people pay you at the end of the month and reporting that income if you send out invoices towards the end of December uh, fully knowing that any cash that would come in would most likely be in January. So that's one way to um, to do that. However, um, uh, some businesses need the cash flow, and, and it doesn't allow for that, but certainly something that we try to always implement with our co- our clients. And, and it's something to look at starting now. I don't think it's too early right now to start uh, looking at uh, invoicing, and, and you – pretty much know how your clients are, their pay uh, schedules, and so uh, if you know a client pays you within, uh, within 15 days, then you may not want to bill them until late December. Um, so that's something to look at. Also, the other, so that's the deferring income piece. Now, on the other side, you can accelerate deductions. Now, that's very easy because that's totally in, under your control because under the cash method of accounting, you get to deduct expenses when you actually pay them. Uh, on the accrual method, it's better because you get to deduct expenses when you receive the invoice. So it's sort of the reverse. But we, we the controls are ours, assuming we have the cash to uh, to pay expenses. So here, what we would like to do is accelerate our deductions, and that would in- entail as trying to get our accounts payable as close to zero as possible every year, fully knowing that we've paid every potential or possible expense we could. Other things that you may want to look at is some January expenses that you could pay um, right at the end of the year, uh, such as rent, uh, utilities, um, uh, anything that you – normal monthly expenses to try to take advantage of the acceleration of deductions. Definitely would do it this year because of the ta- – again, because of the tax rate decrease. Um, so that's sort of how we work with method, of, you know, with the cash method of accounting. Um, and so, if we go to the next slide, um, these are additional tax planning techniques that we employ, uh, no matter what what uh, uh, basis of accounting you're on. So the first thing is bonuses. Now, many of you uh, are already on a flow through type entity, whether you're a partnership, LLC, or S corporation. So um, Bonuses to yourselves won't really make a difference because that's the same income coming to you as wages as opposed to flow through income. But you should also you should look at paying bonuses to your staff. Um, I'm sure many of you do that already. If you're doing it early in 2017, you may want to push it into 16 to get again take advantage of the higher rates and the um, better tax benefit uh, in 2016. But for some of you. Uh, and, and, and especially here in Philadelphia, it's an, an issue because of the city taxes. It's more tax advantageous for us to bonus out profits to the shareholders or to the, the partners than it would be uh, to leave it in there as profits. So uh, even though it's the same income, the city treats it differently. I would uh, hope that you would consult with your tax advisor to make sure there's nothing you can do with bonuses that could – it may not reduce your federal tax, but it certainly can uh, be advantageous to reduce uh, state taxes and, and many local taxes. Um, hey. And as we Michael, get can, I jump, in, come, can uh, I jump in on sure. that? I'm, uh, I'm sorry, on the bonus side, especially for staffing firms, many of you with big temporary staffing practices have uh, multi-jurisdictional issues. You cross state lines and you have uh, many states where your temporary employees are. So by bonusing out uh, your income with uh, maybe W-2 salary and zeroing out your corporate entity's income, you reduce the likelihood at times that your overall income will be subjected to other states' tax, which may or may not be beneficial depending on your individual circumstances. So I just want to emphasize that bonusing, it, uh, these, the notion of bonusing and tax planning um, is more than just uh, the federal tax and payroll taxes. It really incorporates the state taxes that many of you are subject to in a variety of states. Correct. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, Brett spoke to you about donating appreciated property. That's always, a, and that's more at the uh, individual level. That's always a, a, a good technique if you have, um, if you, especially if you have publicly traded stock. Uh, it's very easy. Many, most um, charitable organizations will accept it. Um, 
the benefit of, of donating appreciated property uh, is that you, the deduction that you get is the fair market value of the property that you contribute, and you don't recognize the gain on the difference between what you purchase the property at and what the value of it is um, at the time of uh, contribution. So it's, it's a double positive. We don't get many of those uh, in the tax code. So if you, if you can, if, if, when you see them and, and, you, and they're appropriate for you, you should take advantage of them. Uh, recognizing capital losses, that, that's a very common technique. I mean, that, and that would be something that you would look at at your individual level. If you have capital gains, uh, either from investments or running through from your businesses, um, by, by the end of the year or during the, during now, towards the end of the year, you should look at your other holdings. Uh, if there's, uh, unrealized losses in those holdings, uh, certainly think about harvesting them and, and selling, um, and taking the losses and they'll be able to offset the gains. Keep in mind that you have to wait 30 days from the sale in order to repurchase that stock if, if you so desire. Um, if, if, if you want to get purchase the stock within 30 days, you won't be able to, you won't be able to take the loss. Um, but a common technique is to either buy a company that is similar to the one you sold or, you know, look at ETFs or mutual funds in that industry. Um, retirement contributions are my favorite deduction because you get a deduction and it, and it, and it goes to, um, and, and you get the money in most cases. And now I know in staffing it's difficult uh, because of the amount of employees that are, that are uh, usually um, – on, on staff, but uh, to the extent that there is a vesting, uh, if you have a tremendous amount of turnover, this might be beneficial. Um, so this can be a very complicated uh, uh, area for those of you in the staffing industry, although uh, you should visit, you should look at it because there may be ways, methods, and, and ways to limit the amount of contribution you give to your employees and the majority of the contribution, if not significantly all of the contribution, could go to you. Um, so something to look at. Um, and then timing of medical expenses up, you know, that's simply just trying to bunch your expenses into one year as opposed to spreading it out over two years and not being able to get any deduction at all. And I think for most of us, including those of you that are on the phone, that's a very difficult deduction to get. I always tell my clients you don't want that deduction because you're either really sick or uh, you're not making much income because there's a floor there. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of dedu uh, expenses to get a deduction. So um, I always hope that nobody gets that deduction because it's bad news either way. Um, and then state and local taxes again. You know, uh, if you can if you can accelerate deductions. Now, you would look at your estimated payments, and for many of you, the fourth quarter estimated payment for state for states is due January fifteenth. If you can push it into December and pay it, you can get that deduction uh, in the current year as opposed to waiting till next year. However. As usual, nothing in life is free. Uh, for those of you that are in the AMT uh, or are paying AMT, that deduction is not good because uh, for AMT purposes, that deduction is not allowed. And even though you may make the payment, you won't get any tax benefit for it. So before you go ahead and do it, uh, you might want to talk to your tax guy and see um, if, if you're, there's any benefit for you at all. Um, if, if you live in the northeast of the country, probably not, um, but take a look at it anyway. Um, and then, you know, just to touch on this last slide for me, uh, just, you know, we always tend to um, view tax planning uh, for one year. Um, however, you know, given um, what's going on now with uh, the new proposals, uh, you really should take a look at your tax strategy or tax planning over a two-year period um, because, um, you know, the, the, the uh, aggregation of the two years may be more uh, telling than just looking at one year at a time. So um, we always tend to take a broader view uh, at, at, at somebody's tax situation when we're planning and um, it doesn't always, in every case, uh, 
prove that we should be accelerating uh, deductions and deferring income. There are situations where it could be reversed, but only if you look out more than one year will you be able to see that. Um, so again, and and uh, and and lastly, I said it maybe five or seven or eight times that uh, because there's going to be a rate decrease uh, in 16, uh, 17 as anticipated. Uh, you know, again, see what you can do in order to uh, defer income into that year, uh, into 17, and then accelerate deductions into 16. So with that, uh, I'll shoot it over back to you, BJ. Okay, so um, our, our last point here that we want to discuss isn't quite uh, tax planning or tax related, but it's so critical, especially for our staffing clients. We really wanted to cram this in. Um, hopefully, you are all aware that there are new overtime regulations coming online as of December 1st, so in a couple of weeks. Um, I, I actually did a, a webinar presentation on the overtime regulations yesterday. Um, it is beyond the scope of this presentation to get into the, uh, the real minutia of this, but I really need you to know a couple of things here. First of all, the basics. Um, the new overtime regulations are effective December 1st, and what that means is, is that many, many more of your employees, and not just your temp employees, your internal salaried staff, may very well become eligible for overtime to the extent that they are working more than 40 hours in a work week. So, um, uh, you know, the the basics are to the extent that um, uh, your employees make less than forty seven thousand dollars and change annually, or nine hundred, which breaks down to nine hundred thirteen dollars a week in terms of a weekly salary, if they are below that threshold in compensation, in all likelihood, if they work more than forty hours in a week, you owe them overtime. Uh, and that extends, again, beyond your temporary staff. It extends to your recruiters, your HR staff, your sales staff. Now, there's a lot of nuances here and some exemptions, uh, but rule of thumb is, is for your internal corporate staff, if they're making below $47,000 a year, you need to monitor this closely. Now, the question is, is whether this comes into play. Uh, December 1st is the, uh, the start date for the regulation that was published by the Department of Labor. However, there is a small chance that there's an injunction brought, um, a, a ruled on. There will be a motion, um, there's lawsuits on this, that will be ruled on out of Texas. Next week there will be a ruling as to whether that this, uh, these new regulations are postponed or suspended. It's very unlikely that there's an injunction. Uh, there is a chance that either the new Congress in January or Trump may set aside these regulations. Uh, but even if that's the case, you'll still need to comply with the regulations from December 1st through the date of any tweaks to this, which could extend uh, 8, 10, 12, or more months into 2017. Um, so best be prepared for this. And what does it mean, essentially? Um, what we're recommending is, is that you set forth, you get down into the weeds with either your CFO or your external accountant, lay out in a spreadsheet all your workforce, predominantly your internal workforce, since you're probably paying overtime to your temps where required. Um, but uh, lay out how often, how many hours typically your employees are working, what their roles and responsibilities are, what their compensation is, and then you need to figure out what their hourly rate is you need to convert their salary to an hourly rate so as to determine what you're going to end up paying them for any hours worked over, over 40. Um, the major change here is, is that you need records that capture the time of your salaried employees, and many of you are not used to doing that. You need to have records, a record-keeping system in place for your salaried staff so that you know whether people are working more than 40 hours or not. Now, you may say, hey, my uh, salaried workforce works from nine to five, five days a week, over and done with. They work 40 hours. It's rare that they go over. Um, end of story. But what you don't realize is that the Department of Labor is now considering any time spent by your employees outside of work as potentially compensable time, meaning that if you have employees that are answering emails or phone calls or making sales calls, following up monitoring um, activities from home, 
that's compensable time. And if that crosses the employee over 40 hours, you owe them overtime. So this is a really big deal. And if you don't have records, uh, I can tell you that that's a really – timekeeping records – that's a really bad fact in the event of either a Department of Labor investigation or a, a class action workforce lawsuit, which have become more prevalent also. You need to have records, uh, and you need to really address your policies and procedures for your workforce so as to delineate uh, whether and how overtime will be, um, whether it's acceptable or not. For instance, some uh, staffing companies are considering changing from a 40-hour typical work week to maybe a 38- or 39-hour work week um, so that there may be a built-in hour or two a week for employees that typically do work at, from home um, that may shelter you from exposure to overtime. Uh, certainly your policies and procedures should indicate to your workforce that uh, any overtime must be pre-approved. Now that's, uh, you know, even if the employee goes over 40 hours and it's not approved, you still have to pay them the overtime, but at least you can, um, you can hold their feet to the fire and uh, determine uh, uh, how you want to deal with the chronic offenders uh, to that policy. But really, uh, there's a whole um, a ton of information uh, associated with these regulations that uh, goes beyond the scope of this presentation. But you need to be aware of this. You need to check with your accountant, your CFO, and potentially your labor uh, attorneys to help you navigate uh, this really important topic. So with that, that uh, brings to a close the, uh, the actual presentation that we have for you today. We're certainly happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, and uh, Amanda, if you uh, would like to take it from here and coordinate, that would, be, uh, that would be fine. Sounds good. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and enter your question into either the chat or the Q&A section, and then we'll answer the questions as they come in. Um, I do have a question that has come in. If an employee is paid on an hourly basis, are they automatically eligible for time and a half overtime? Uh, well, typically the answer would be yes, although it de depends on what uh, that employee is uh, is doing. Um, again, it gets this becomes more of a legal question than anything else. So uh, before I, I give you an affirmative answer to that, I'd want to know more, and I'd want to probably rope in, loop in uh, your employment attorney. But typically, typically the answer is, is yes. Another important piece to that um, new overtime regulation is um, the bonuses and the percent of um, commission salary uh, can count towards that total $47,000 figure, too. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, if you look at it on a, a weekly basis, uh, your target um, compensation is $913 of gross pay a week uh, that you want to try and exceed so that you're not having to pay overtime. You can pay on an ongoing basis 90% uh, of that figure, so doing the math real quick, 90% times 913, if you pay at least $821 in gross pay a week, but there is a non-discretionary bonus, commissions, um, or, but it, it must be non-discretionary, and it's paid at least quarterly, that can get you over that threshold as well. Um, so that's an important point as, as well. Wonderful. Um, so. What should my first step be with regard to compliance to the overtime regulations? Uh, first step is absolutely laying out uh, in a spreadsheet format your workforce, uh, the typical average hours worked per person, their roles and responsibilities, uh, and their compensation. You need to convert their salary to uh, at least an, uh, an hourly rate. Um, so that you can at least make some meaningful decisions uh, as far as your exposure to overtime. Um, there are tactics that can be taken to, to sort of minimize that exposure and that liability and the costs associated with this, uh, these new regulations. But your starting point is getting into the weeds and laying out your workforce. And, and your CPA or your CFO should be able to help you, um, help you with this. For accrual and cash method for uh, the deductions that you spoke about earlier, what is the, ter the determining factor as if you are an accrual basis or a cash method? Uh, so, so on accrual basis, 
uh, if you're, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but if you're on a accrual basis, uh, you would be able to deduct expenses when you receive the invoice uh, from your vendor. Uh, if you're on the cash basis, uh, you would you would deduct the uh, deduction. You would take the deduction when you actually pay the cash. So big difference there. Um, I if think the that question, if the question was how you know what determines whether I'm on the cash basis or accrual basis, you should you should generally know that most staffing companies are eligible for the cash basis of accounting, um, regardless of size. And that, right. that is a good fact. Um, and we do see we see staffing companies that are on the accrual basis of accounting for taxes, and that's usually a major error um, and costs uh, the staffing company or causes the staffing company to be paying more on an annual basis than they need to be paying uh, for taxes uh, because you're paying, paying taxes on receivables instead of your collections. I'm not sure, again, like Michael said, I'm not sure that that was the focus of the question, but... Hopefully that answers. I think it does answer it. That that looks like um, that was the the question. So thank you. Okay. Um, what information should I be providing to my accountant now to help with year end tax planning? Uh, certainly, uh, you know clearly if. if uh, what I always ask for is a current year uh, profit and loss statement and a current year balance sheet. Uh, and that, from that, at that point, uh, you know, that's a great starting point. What would be very helpful uh, is if you had a good idea as to what your invoicing will, is going to be for the remainder of the year, uh, your anticipated cash collections, uh, as well as uh, a list of expenses you plan on paying uh, for the remainder of the year and some potential expenses that could be accelerated uh, into 2016 that uh, are due in early 17. Um, if, you know, I, if you go through this every year, you start to get a hang of what, what's needed and, uh, and it becomes fairly uh, they are fairly uh, easy to start to plan, but certainly those are the those are the keys to to looking at the situation and making the best decisions. And how likely is it that Trump's tax cuts are fully enacted? Can you repeat that? How likely is it that Trump's tax cuts are fully enacted? Oh, I mean. I'll answer that. I mean, those are proposals. I think, uh, you know, certainly I, I would seriously doubt that 100% of them will be enacted, and the and if they are enacted, they won't be uh, enacted as proposed. So this is his opening salvo. I think there's already some resistance from from Congress as to the the extent of the tax cuts. Um, but it's certainly a starting point, and I'm sure there'll be a tremendous amount of negotiations between the legislative branches uh, until they finally come up with something that works. But I know uh, there are some serious uh, um, consideration of how much this is going to add to the national deficit, and therefore, um, you know, that's why I believe and others believe that this is just uh, a starting point. In, in your experience, is there a best practice um, technique that a staffing company should be considering um, in the tax planning? Um, well, I would say certainly, as mentioned before, that WOTC we see WOTC credit, work opportunity tax credit, is a big miss for many uh, staffing companies. They just aren't aware of it or their accountants haven't made them aware. Um, it really is, it can be a, a gold mine. Um, staffing companies also are really, those with um, a lot of temps, contract workers, tend to have um, workers spread over many states and local jurisdictions. So I think beyond the federal planning, you really need to look at the state income tax planning uh, element of the, the, whole, uh, the whole picture. Um, but also, so, yeah, the, com the state compliance is an issue too. A lot of, we see a lot of companies that are in states and not paying taxes in those states. So, so uh, it's a good idea to get an get a uh, get an estimate of what your exposure is. Yeah, some states have. Uh, it's rare, but some states have sales tax 
that applies to staffing revenues, um, Pennsylvania being one of them. And uh, for those that are operating, you know, dipping their toe in the water in a particular state, you may not know exactly what those regulations are in that state, and they can be very different. And for the, the WASI tax credits, if you have a larger tax credit available than you owe in taxes, is it true that you can um, continue to take that um, deduction the following year, the remaining amount that you were unable to uh, realize in the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they carry over, so you don't lose them. You might not get the full credit for it in the current year, but you don't lose it. It will carry forward to eventually when you can use it, when you have the right balance of taxable income to, to use the credits. Which is nice that you don't use it or lose it, you actually get the chance to take advantage of it. Um, and, and TRICOM has a, a great WASI program here too that we can certainly help any staffing company get started on if they're interested in doing it. And a lot of information about um, the different categories. Um, and you can certainly reach out to, to you know, any of us here on the webinar today, put my contact information. Um, as well as Citrin's uh, up on the screen now, uh, you can get more information on how you can take advantage of those um, tax credits with that program. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up today? Um, not specifically. Just to understand, again, it's a moving target on the tax rates. Uh, watch these overtime regulations in the next week to see if there's an injunction. I don't think there will be one. Um, you, you have a lot of work to do with your CFOs and your accountants um, on, on these issues, uh, but with some proactive tax planning and some recognition of the uh, uh, new regulations that are floating out there, you should be uh, um, well taken care of. And again, if you and, and if you have any questions, we're we're always happy to answer your questions. If you should come up with something at a later time, absolutely. Don't uh, don't fear reaching out to us. We're happy, uh, gratis to to give you a hand. Wonderful. Well, again, uh, as we wrap up today, I just, I'd just i like to thank our participants for joining us. And um, BJ, Michael, and Brett, uh, your time today in preparing um, a year-end planning um, 2016 update for businesses. We will have a recording of the uh, webinar presentation available on our website under tricom.com. It's under our Resources, Industry Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, everyone.